So we could shorten up this whole thing and go, don't vape, go back to class. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but it turns out they worked out the schedule, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna stick with that. So we're gonna, they asked me to, uh, Mr. Turner asked me to come and talk to, vape, uh, talk to you about vaping because, and it's an interesting thing, there's a number of reasons why. Um, without pointing at anybody, how many of you know somebody in this room who vapes? Okay, so that's, that's, that's the reason why we're talking about this, because the thing is, what's the long-term effect of vaping? We don't know. We don't know, but what we do know is that um, what's in vaping, which is nicotine, is It turns out it's amazingly addictive, right? It's amazingly addictive. And part of the reason why is that it acts like a stimulant and like a sedative right on top of it. And the initial um, dose when it hits you, it increases your blood pressure, it increases your heart rate, there's a release of adrenaline. It also does this thing where it knocks your insulin rate down, and because your insulin rate goes down, your glucose and sugar levels go up. There's another kind of a side effect of it where there's a release of dopamine in the brain, which is the release of the pleasure center, like when you do something good, when you score a goal, when you get a good grade, when somebody uh, tells you you did a great job, when somebody smiles at you and says, you're doing okay, right? And you feel good, <laughs> right? And you feel good. There's a release of chemicals in your brain and it makes you feel better. And what you do, what well, turns out, it's addictive, right? It turns out it's addictive. It's as addictive as heroin and cocaine. <laughs> so some of you might be asking like, why would they legalize something? Why would they legalize a product that the main reason for it is to be a delivery system for nicotine? Because what nicotine does, as far as we know, the only thing that nicotine really does well is it makes you want more nicotine. Now, um, my background, I guess I'm supposed to say something about this. Um, I, uh, I have a master's in education and community counseling from uh, Loyola University of Chicago. Go Ramblers. Um, I got... <laughs> got my bachelor's in psych from Catholic U in Washington, DC. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. This appropriate response. And, um, I, I worked as a director of youth services for Oak Park River Forest Townships for 25 years. And <laughs> ran a gang and drug task force and did some interesting stuff there. The um, other thing is um, when I was working for uh, Family Services and Mental Health Center for Oak Park and River Forest for five years in a number of different positions, one of them for a couple of years was as a, a prevention specialist and a prevention coordinator. And things that we were working on at that time in the 90s was knocking down smoking among your age group. Now, um, at that time, things that we were working on and pointing out to people was how highly manipulative the ad campaigns were to get young people to start smoking. And one of the things that we talk about at that time is a character called Joe Camel, which is basically a cartoon figure. And the thing was that there were five-year-olds who recognized Joe Camel as readily, as readily as they would recognize the logo for um, Disney World, for Mickey Mouse. Now, when you're doing that, it's hard to make an argument that you're, ar that you're trying to um, get the appeal of adults, right? And there's a reason for that, and the um, tobacco companies did a lot of research on um, how to target people and get them going, and one of the things uh, that they were able to find out that has been transferred over from the tobacco industry to another, just a different delivery version for the tobacco industry, which is now called vaping or e-cigarettes, right? They looked at all that research, and one of the reasons why they want you is it turns out that when people your age start using a product that has nicotine in it, it develops incredible brand loyalty. And you keep on using that product for a long time because addicts get into habits. It's not just habit forming, you get into a habit about how you use your habit. 
the color schemes and the advertising. Even the way that they do it, they, they, um, it was restricted for how you can advertise uh, for this product uh, for uh, a number of years. Um, just in the last 10, really, that has really been um, nailed down with how much you can advertise uh, tobacco. Um, but how they go around that? Social media. So I have people who are influencers. You go on YouTube. Uh, and how many of you go on YouTube? Just show of hands. Don't make any noise, right? Uh, on YouTube, how many of you have seen people that you follow on YouTube vaping? Again, target population. Who are they, who are they going after with this? Now, I want to tell you, having worked with people uh, over the last 30 years or so um, who managed to get off of being addicted to heroin and cocaine, that is not easy work. And the same thing is true of getting off nicotine. It's not easy work. So the easiest thing is don't do it in the first place, right? But if you already have that going on, and the stats tell us it's one in four people in this room, in your age group, it's 27.5% right now. You want to talk about fresh data, this is in the last 48 hours that this data has been coming out, because they're really paying attention to it now. And they we're really paying attention to it now because there's been, well, as of last Thursday, I think it was uh, 137 deaths. Thousands of people across a uh, number of states who uh, have been hospitalized for different damage to their lungs. They have different names for it. They have a new one that they've come out. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but. Uh, if you have any doubt about whether or not something is addictive, and uh, those of you who uh, might remember the first night uh, that I might have seen you, um, your freshman year, talking about um, the FAB event, right? Fenwick at its best. I showed this slide this year, which is, these are the 11 things that are indicators of whether or not something is a substance abuse issue. And I don't have to read them to you, you can read them for yourself. But there's 11 of them, and if you have one or two of these going on with your relationship to a drug, then that means you've got a mild substance abuse issue. If it's four or five, you have a moderate, pretty good issue on, and you need some serious help going on there. If it's more than five, you have a full-blown serious addiction issue. So a self-check on there, if you yourself are vaping, this might be something that you want to look at. Because if you've got more than one or two of these, you've got something going on you really, really, really need to pay attention to. Um, those of you who know people who vape, have you ever noticed that their behavior starts to change if they haven't uh, gotten a dose in a certain amount of time? Craving it, all they talked about. You have friends who like when they, they, um, they start talking about it even though you're not interested? They'll talk about the next time they're going to go. Um, a feeling of emptiness, that's an interesting one. Emptiness or loneliness, that can lead towards things like depression, anxiety, uh, moodiness, really irritable, and a difficulty focusing or paying attention to stuff. Now, this good looking guy is my dad. Um, this, uh, this thing, how old do you think he is in this picture? Uh, this, is his, this is his high school graduation picture. Now here's the thing, before 1950, everybody who was 18 years old looked like they were full-blown adults for a number of years and had a car and a mortgage, right? Um, but, uh, but this him is a healthy guy. Now, um, I love my dad, he's a real good man. Uh, he's got five kids, he's got 11 grandkids, he's got uh, six great-grandchildren and counting um, so far as we go like this. And um, he started smoking when he was 10 years old. And some of you are going, well, that's crazy, 10-year-olds. But guess what? There's over a million middle school children who are vaping right now. Now, how did he do this? This was in when he was 10, served in the Air Force. I like that picture of him, too, there. Um, when he was 10 years old in 1941, uh, there was not a lot of public information out about how dangerous cigarette smoking was, right? So he was an Army brat. He came up on Army bases. Uh, his dad was a master sergeant. Uh, served in World War I, World War II in Korea, and he went around from base to base, and it turned out that they gave away cigarettes real easy, and they gave it to everybody. So he was driving when he was 11 on a base, and he was smoking cigarettes when he was 10. Now there, it looks like he's doing pretty good, right? Doesn't seem like it's affecting him too much. But um, now he's at, um, he's an end-stage cancer and um, out in Pennsylvania. Sorry, just need a second here. 
And uh, these are the two things that are racing to see which one is gonna take him out of this world first. So the one is cancer, a lot of people are familiar with that. And basically what that is, is there's a mutation in your cells that start to cause uncontrollable growth. And then that growth keeps on going and it competes with the rest of your body to be fed and keep on growing. And as it does that, it basically starves the rest of your body, takes up more and more space until you expire. So it's metastasized, it's all through his body now, it's untreatable. The other thing that he has is this thing called vascular dementia. Now vascular dementia is, um, it affects your blood vessels, right? So it constricts them and then it restricts flow. And then what happens is it starts to have an impact on different parts of your body. And uh, one of the ones in particular is your brain, blood flow to your brain. So what's happening here now is there are times where he forgets where he's at and what he's doing and he can't really take care of himself, so we have him in a, in a, in a center, and now he's on the dementia unit. Uh, we have people taking care of him, and they're really kind, great people. Uh, so I feel good about that, and enough of my family live close enough by that they're able to adjust their schedules and see him, right, um, as we go through this. And there's times that he's real sharp and wants to uh, talk baseball, and uh, he's a big Yankee fan, likes to talk about those things, and um, right on point. And then there's other times where he forgets where he is, and it's kind of scary for him because he's been in control of things his whole life, and now he's not. And both of these things are tied to smoking cigarettes. Both of these are tied to being addicted to a product called nicotine that in and of itself, it's interesting, they don't have long-term studies on the effect of nicotine on our bodies. They haven't done that because all the packaging that nicotine comes in, turns out, does stuff that kills us. So you could say, well, you know, he started doing that in the 1940s. We didn't know any better, right? We didn't know any better. Um, leading cause of preventable death in the world is tobacco use, right? In the United States, over 480,000 people per year die because of their relationship to tobacco. That's 1,300 people per day. That's basically everyone in this room every day of the year. Sometimes you get into the millions, it's hard to figure out how to think about these things you get the big numbers. But that's everybody in this room, every day, passing away. Just to get the idea, the scope on this. And over seven million people per year worldwide. Now, this debate goes back a long time. In the 1600s, when they first started moving tobacco around the world and trading it and people were using it, there was an argument, this is over 400 years ago, about well, some people thought it had medicinal properties. This could be a good thing for us. And other people go, no, this is toxic and habit forming. They were having that conversation 400 years before the FDA or the CDC or anybody else was even talking about this stuff. In 1763, they used it as an insecticide. In 1828, a scientist broke it down and found that in tobacco, the activating uh, ingredient was nicotine and they identified it as a poison. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was working at the township, I ended up getting involved in a case where a group of sixth graders had taken uh, a number of uh, cigarettes and then used the distilling process to get out a pure version of nicotine, but their goal was they were gonna poison the teacher. And when they looked at it, it would have done it, it would have killed them. So this is what people, you know, like why, why would people smoke something like this? This is kind of interesting, right? In the 1890s in this country, there are 24 states who said, Tobacco is such a dangerous thing, we have to ban it. We have to ban the sale to minors. In the 1890s, I think, somebody could check me on this, I think in the 1890s there still weren't any child labor laws. And children were still considered property in terms of the legal system. So even under those conditions they said, this is bad, right? Um, so it's not until 1964 that the Surgeon General comes out with a real clear statement based on science and research that uh, t tobacco use leads to heart disease and lung cancer. Now, 1964, just to have a clear idea of how long ago that is, that's the year I was born. So I'm real clear on that's 55 years ago. So there has been a warning label on tobacco products that they have different ways of saying it, but the long and short of it is, if you, just a heads up, if you use this product, it's addictive and it will frickin' kill you. So my whole life, this has been the case, and yet still, legal, 
1994, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, says, you know what, we think it's addictive. We have enough data to say this stuff causes dependency. And it's not until June of 2009, now we're in your lifetime, right? It's in June of 2009 that the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act comes out that starts to seriously um, ha give power to the FDA to uh, have some oversight on production and on advertising um, for tobacco use. So the new thing that comes out now, and during that time when I was uh, doing prevention work, and it's, you know millions of other people doing that work, uh, a lot of funding from the government uh, to go in and reduce the number of people smoking, who did we need to go after if we really wanted to reduce smoking? It's two groups, current smokers who are adults. And the other thing, the more efficient thing, is don't get people doing it in the first place. So we started going after the same people that the big tobacco was going after, you. And the thing that turned out to be, that interestingly enough was um, more effective were things like what it does to your breath, how it changes the color of your nails, how it makes you smell. Those things were more important to teenagers than, oh, by the way, later on in life, this will make you sick and kill you. Because when you're your age, you think, you know, part of the, the joy of being your age um, is you feel like you have all the time in the world, right? And you feel bulletproof and immortal and invisible, which the last one is, makes it easy for teachers and adults to catch you doing stuff, by the way, sometimes, because you're not invisible. But that's the effect of adrenaline and um, uh, testosterone and estrogen on you as you feel full of life. So it turned out that bad breath was more of an efficient thing to go after. So the same companies that do this kind of stuff also came up with ways to cover up the breath. The other thing it did was it made your teeth look nasty, so what they come up with? Teeth whitening strips, right? We have something, and then, yeah, ironically, they make more profit, right, off of every cure for every problem that's been created. Uh, does that sound manipulative to you? Sounds highly manipulative to me in terms of how that works out. So. Given that those uh, efforts turn out to be successful, Big Tobacco um, has a bunch of settlements with the government because they were doing things that were shady and they have to pay out billions of dollars. Those billions of dollars that come out, I think it's $27 billion in a year, are supposed to go through all 50 states to go towards educating people and reducing uh, smoking and reducing tobacco use. How much of that money gets used for that? What the FDA recommends on it, it's less than 3% actually is getting spent on that. There's only two states out of the 50 that are using 70% of what the recommendation from the FDA is to use on those things. So they made a big payment, but it turns out it's not going for what it's supposed to. So what they came up with is a new delivery system, right? And that's what vaping is. All it is is a delivery system for nicotine. And, and there are people, and I've, I've had conversations with some people in this room, that, um, well, you know, it's water vapor. And it's just flavored water vapor, and there's, 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 uh, there's versions of it that doesn't have any nicotine in it. Well, they did some studies, and guess what they found out? The stuff that says it has no nicotine in it, guess what it has in it? Nicotine. One of the ways that they advertised vaping uh, from the companies that, um, that do this, and the one that uh, a lot of people focus on right now is called Juul, because it's about two-thirds of the market share of people your age who are using them use that product. Um, some of the stuff that they were doing in this was they were trying to get their product space on shelves in stores. And the stores were like, we don't think this is going to sell. People don't know the product. They don't, they don't like it. Smokers like cigarettes. That's, you know, that's how it's going to be. But what they did, the sales force went out and used the science that they were uh, using in this um, uh, business to go and show people who sell products that, no, 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 see this, see this chart? This has so much nicotine in it, it's as addictive as cigarettes and it's a more efficient delivery system. So the selling point for this to get the people who put it on their shelves and sell it was the sales force went out and said, no, you should put this on your shelf because this stuff is addictive. One pod is equivalent to 20 cigarettes. Each cigarette has about a milligram of nicotine in it in terms of what goes into your body and it only takes five milligrams of use of the product, apparently, to reach a point where you start having craving and uh, addiction-like symptoms related to it. 
So what they're doing is they're multiplying that by a factor of four every time somebody uses a whole pod. Now, the argument this week, because the government has jumped all over this because people are dying and people are getting weird diseases and stuff in their lungs, and the FDA and the scientists and the Centers for Disease Control are looking at this stuff, and they're kind of looking at each other going, we don't know which thing is the causing factor. There's so many different things that are getting burned up. It's not just the nicotine. It's all the stuff around the nicotine, because apparently nicotine tastes terrible. So what they do is they cover it up with all these different flavors. You have the combina combination of something that's really addictive, but tastes sweet. And again, who are you going after when you're using fruit and mint flavor? Other flavors they were using are basically different uh, flavorings of Kool-Aid. Things like uh, other ones are creme, creme brulee. Does creme brulee make you think of nicotine? I mean, but but that's, this is the kind of stuff that they're, mango, right? Um, so the argument this week is they're putting bans on all kind of flavors, and the ones that they want to ban this week are mint and menthol. Guess who's pushing really back on that? The same people who make this product in the first place. Um, other stuff that's particularly shady about this, some of their own scientists pointed out, you know what? We did a really good job. The delivery system for nicotine is so efficient and so strong that people can get addicted to this a lot quicker. So one of their scientists said, you know what, we should probably put like some kind of a break on this thing where a half hour after you use it, for that half hour, the thing shuts down so your body has time to recover from it. So you don't go taking uh, dose after dose after dose. So they had this discussion internally. Kind of interesting, that technology never got put on the table. So this is about a business model, right? Because if you get somebody addicted to a product, and they, got it, they have to use it over and over and over again, otherwise they get headaches, they feel nauseous, they're irritable as hell, they're difficult to be around. Turns out, and they're addicted to it for the rest of their life, and they have brand loyalty, it turns out you make a lot of money. A $28 billion business. So this is from, all this stuff is a moving target. As I've been researching this, I've had to update my research every couple of hours because new studies and new information is coming out, including today, because Thursday is the day that they update at the Centers for Disease Control. Thursday is the day that they update how many deaths happened related to vaping. So it'll be, there'll be more from what we talked about even this morning. So in um, one of these, the title of the article, and uh, the business, Reuters Business Insider, is devices were hooking teens. There's a quote from that article. San Francisco startup that invented groundbreaking Jewel e-cigarette had a central goal during its development, captivating users with the first hit. Captivating users with the first hit. What does that sound like they weren't trying to do? Get you addicted the first time you use it. Employees started talking, noticed as early as four years ago that teenagers, people your age, were calling the company asking where they could buy more jewels and pods that contain liquid nicotine, even though it was illegal for them to purchase it. So did they have some kind of an inkling that teenagers were using the uh, product? Definitely. Well known that young customers were, and this is from research from the tobacco companies, right? The most profitable segment in the history of the tobacco industry is teens because research shows that nicotine users who start as teenagers are the most likely to become lifelong addicts. There's a difference between being a customer and an addict, right? In 2018, we had three million people your age who had tried uh, vaping uh, the prior month. So one in five. One in four vaped at least 20 days per month. And then just a uh, couple of months ago, 27.5%, so more than one in four. So it's gone from 20% to over 27%. And now, just this week, it's 4.1 million high school students and 1.2 million middle school students. Anybody have younger brothers or sisters? That age group? Now, why would you have a company, how do you, I, I'm just curious about how you feel about a company using science, using billions of dollars of advertising to manipulate things to get your younger brother or sister addicted to a product that's harmful for them that they will, if they start using it, odds are that they'll be wanting to use it the rest of their life. 
I'll, I'll be very frank about my feeling about that. that kind of pisses me off. The other thing that, uh, that angers me about this is that the Food and Drug Administration, when vaping was first getting patented and putting out and, and, and put it out on all this stuff, they leaned really hard and said, you know what, this is a terrible idea. We don't know, we don't have enough information about it, what it does with people igniting uh, nicotine to 1200 degrees and sucking it in their lungs. We don't know what the long-term effects of that and the water vapor are. But what we do know is these other things we're really suspicious of is the flavoring. We haven't even tested those, and so we don't know what it is. You need to put the brakes on that and not have it go. They took the better part of four months to bring hundreds of lobbyists in against the FDA and push over and over and over and over again until the administration uh, at the time that was uh, President Obama was in office at that time it was his FDA. They folded and they went ahead and let them do it. And the thing was, the choice was, they were concerned about how it would affect the profitability of a new business. So I've heard people use this expression, profits over people. Money more than human beings. It's more important, more important to make a buck. Everyone knows Dr. Lorden? I like Jerry, I've known him for a long time. And one of the things that really struck me when he was talking at the, uh, um, the father's picnic, that that was named after him, which is good, good for you for doing that. That's a great thing to do, he deserves that. Um, he talked about how a graduate from here who had um, some uh, significant success in life, and I apologize that I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he said that one of the most important courses that he ever took was on business ethics. This is the kind of stuff that happens when people are not practicing business, business ethics, when you put profit over people. So I already said that. Um, so they, uh, they interviewed a, uh, a kid your age, a senior in high school, and on that same article, um, and uh, he went from trying at one time to, in a short order, he was using a pot a day, which is the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes or 20 cigarettes worth of nicotine every day. His grades went down. He experienced wild mood swings. And these are quotes from him. It honestly controlled me. It's almost like I was going insane. Harvard just came out with a study after following 1,600 teams. 58% of kids who were vaping, they kept on using. 17% of people who ever tried cigarettes continued doing it. So which is more effective at hooking people? Turns out vaping, now this is fascinating because you know how they marketed vaping to us in the first place? They told us it was a tool to get uh, chronic adult smokers to level down and stop using cigarettes so much so that they would live longer and have a better life and help them get off it. It was, if you uh, pardon the analogy, it's like the methadone treatment version of tobacco. Methadone is a chemical that they use to help people who are addicted to heroin get off of heroin. And people go, aren't you just trading addictions? True, but you're trading it for something that is less likely to, uh, to kill you as fast, right? That's the goal there. But uh, never gonna go and get new, new, uh, new customers. But the customer growth here was over 500% per annum, a 500% increase in sales and money every quarter, every year. And when money gets to a certain point, people start to act differently. So all things they, that they were talked about ethically in-house, none of those arguments won. The argument that won was always to get more money, right? Another thing he says, look at the language on this. This is the language that addicts use. I just want to tell you. This is the language that addicts use. The second you're done hitting it, you want to use it again. It's something that made my life worse, made my life terrible. I wish I had never started. And I put that up there because this is, you know, this is, the, this is how people your age who have a problem with this are talking about it. So again, we could do, sum up the whole thing. Really, Don't vape. Bad for you. Don't do it. The other thing is this, if you're already on this road, you're already having some of these problems already, here's the thing, go get some help and get off this stuff. And you are gonna need help because it's addictive as hell. And it's that way by design. And again, that's the thing that angers me about this. It's by design, okay? As of a week ago today, 
37 vaping-related deaths. Over 24 states, over 1,800 people, cases of what they're calling a volley, right? in uh, 49 states. And what a valley is, is e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injury. So the damage that this stuff is causing, it's so new they have to make up a new name for it. They also call it pneumocytosis, which is like uh, pneumonia in your lungs. Another thing that they um, uh, refer to it as is a thing called popcorn lung. Have heard of that one? The reason they call it popcorn lung was there were people who were in factories uh, last century um, where they were making popcorn and the kind of chemicals that they used there when they aerosoled and inhaled, they caused damage to people's lungs. Um, and uh, that damage can be pretty brutal uh, to the point where we've had people die. Now the other thing about this product is that people use it for things that it was not, well they say it wasn't intended to, is um, they put THC pods in there or marijuana in there. And again, what's the long-term effect of marijuana use? Do we know? Turns out we don't know. Do we know what the long-term effect is on people your age? No, but are there people doing it and using it? You understand that you are the guinea pigs for this product right now in terms of how this goes. And I just want to tell you, have some assertiveness in your life. Don't become somebody else's dog in this situation because that's what they're trying to do, is get you hooked on something and have you be subservient to it. Now being of service to your community, being of service to your God, being, conserv being of service to your family, those are all good things. Being subservient to a product, that's not, a, especially if it's addiction, it's not a choice. And the only thing to do is not get into that situation in the first place. Now, um, gentlemen, who uh, works with issues of addiction out in uh, the Dakotas. Runs a place called uh, Stronghold Counseling. His name is uh, J.C. Chambers. He was an 18-year-old kid, came up with this model too. Talked about how you get addicted to things. The first thing is a one-night stand, right? It's like a one-night stand in terms of your relationship. You try, in this case, you try vaping one time. You go, I'll just try it and see what it's like. Another, another note, by the way, on this, another story that came out this week, there's so many of them, is a young man tried vaping. He thought he, his information from his friend was that it was, uh, it was a nicotine pod. It turned out it had THC in it. He ended up in the hospital. Gets kicked out of his school because he was vaping on school property, right? And he was using THC. And he goes, well, I didn't know. Now, who betrayed him in that particular instance? His friend, because you can't get betrayed by people you don't trust, right? So I'm just saying, it's interesting how people use each other in these situations and money gets on the table. So things move from being a one-night stand or you're going to just do it one time and then you feel a little dirty and guilty about it, but then you start thinking about it over and over again. So you go back and you do it again. Then you go and you're like, you know what, I'm going to try this, but I'm going to limit it. I'm going to use it just one time a week. You find out you can't do that. You get fully engaged with it. You buy your own, you start buying extra stuff. All your conversations start to talk about that. Um, you know like when your friends start dating and then all they talk about is the person that they're dating and the next time they're gonna date and the other things they're gonna do and you don't see them very often anymore for a period of time. Same thing happens when somebody gets into a relationship with a chemical and they are not in control of the situation. It goes in, they get into a full committed relationship and then it takes a while for them to figure out they're an abusive relationship and they gotta go through a painful divorce. And divorce is usually through treatment, a lot of expensive stuff, and uh, getting help to get out of the relationship. The other thing that happens is you have to change who you hang out with because if you're hanging out with other people who are vaping all the time, they encourage you to keep on doing the behavior that's terrible for you, right? So, Okay, we're right on time. A thing that uh, comes from Oscar Wilde, I, I just want to, how do I say this in a real clear way? Um, you're better than this. Everyone in this room, you're better than this than to be manipulated by people who want to make money off your young bodies. You're worth more than that. And uh, poet Oscar Wilde says, be yourself because everybody else is already taken. I love this idea. The thing is, each one of you is the most unique person that's ever existed in the history of the universe. Even if there are multiverses, 
as it goes through. There's, only, there's really only one of you as you are right now. And a whole world is punished and loses out if you don't become who you are in this place. Don't let something like this get in the way of you being who you are, because we need you. Um, and as a friend of mine, Greg Kimura, said in a, a poem called Cargo, he goes, you have gifts and the world needs your gifts. You gotta deliver them. Don't let a product get in the way of your life. Now again, we're at the, let me get back, if I can get back there real quick, because I just wanna look at my dad again. Okay. Um, his time is short now, right? But this is him when he was your age. Uh, everybody has to leave this place at some point. But the way he's going out is uncomfortable. It could have been different. He didn't know anything about the things that we're talking about today. When he was 10, when he was 18, even when I was born, he didn't know. No one told him. We don't have an excuse. You got the information. The thing is, you have to find a way to act like it. And if you can't find a way to do that, go for this. You're worth more than this. You're worth more than $28 billion of somebody else's profit margin. You're irreplaceable. If you have a friend who's having a hard time with this, be a friend, lean in a little bit. Lean in a little bit and help them get healthy, okay? Thank you for your time and attention this morning.